Amen. <clears throat> Privilege to be sharing God's Word with you this evening. I want to spend a few moments looking at Romans 13 and from verse 11. And we're going to talk about the day is at hand. I know I touched on this a few weeks ago, but just God has put this in my heart and I want to share it with you tonight. And that knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, nor in cha uh, chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And I want to take for our text, uh, verse 12. <clears throat> the night is far spent and the day is at hand. You know, we know and we've looked at it before that the New Testament church was suffering much persecution. For example, uh, we quote it quite often in Thessalonica, they were being martyred for their faith. And so Paul felt the need to write that beautiful epistle and telling them we are not as those who have no hope. And he spoke about the dead in Christ rising and the Lord returning. And so we look here and we see Paul writing to the believers in Rome. And he's encouraging them not to give up hope because the day is at hand. In other words, he was saying to them that uh, there's deliverance is going to come. At the end of this uh, war, we will win. There will be battles but at the end of this war, we will win. The day is at hand. Trying to encourage them as God's servant should encourage. Now, I know that some will look at this and they will say that, well, this, was a, this epistle was approximately 2,000 or so years ago, and yet the day has not yet come. But you know, the biblical truth is that that day has an appointed and fixed date. No one knows it, only God himself alone. No one will change it. No one will make it earlier. No one will delay the Lord. But the day is at hand. God will fulfill his purpose. And as each day goes by, we are being drawn closer to the day when Jesus Christ returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you know, it's a wonderful way to live your life, is it not? And I think this also was Paul's uh, encouragement to the church in Thessalonica, to, to the church uh, in Rome. The day is at hand. You were to live as if the coming of the Lord was the next day. You know, it's a sobering motivation, isn't it, to know in your heart or to believe in your heart that God was returning the next day. I think it would make us more zealous. It would make us seek his face more. It would make us witness more because we all have people that we don't want to see enter in to a lost eternity. And so we know even back then, in fact, we, we do know that a lot of them believed so much that God's return was soon that they were selling their houses, selling their possessions, and they were giving them to the church to help the poor and the needy. And this was a belief that the Lord would return soon. And as believers in these last days, we are eagerly looking forward to that glorious day. I quoted her, the late Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth who said that she wanted uh, the, the Lord to return uh, while she was alive because she wanted to cast her crown at his feet. And that's how she lived her life and that's how we should live our lives. Because again in verse 12 we see the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. In other words another day is over. Another month is over. Another year is over. And we are moving forward to that day when the Lord himself shall return. And you know, right from our Lord's ascension into heaven until his return, it can be regarded, as it were, as we look at the word, as night. It can, it can be regarded as night because it is a period, although we live in the kingdom of God as Christians, but there's two kingdoms here on earth at the moment. And when you look at the world, we see a period of moral and spiritual darkness. It's a period during which the God of this world, we are told, is actively blinding and leading men captive at his will. Men are blinded by Satan. 
They have no regard for God because they are blinded by Satan, as we once were before we were saved. Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4. He said, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the eyes of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in unto them. And we were blinded. I was blinded. I had no concept or no idea of a need of salvation. I thought, well, I'm not the worst person in the world. And that was uh, my belief. Uh, I remember my mother used to always say uh, she, she was a good person. And because he's a God of love, he would love her. And we just, well, spoke to her many times about that. But that's the, 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 the blindness that men have today. The blindness that they have. Just officiating at a funeral the other day. And apparently everybody's up in heaven partying. You know, uh, and you don't like to make it worse for them on the day they're burying a loved one. But you know something, everybody's not up in heaven. One, they're all resting in their grave. But two, unless you're saved, you'll not enter into the kingdom of God. But men are blinded. And you, you hear it, I, was, I think it was, uh, oh, I can't even remember his name. He used to come here and preach. I'll remember it later. But I remember him saying once when he was preaching here one Sunday morning, he said, there's more lies told at a graveside than there is anywhere else in the world. And you don't, I mean, you're not going to stand at a graveside and tell their family, oh, he's going to burn in hell, you know. But you've got to tell the truth, and you've got to do it in a nice way. Men are blinded by Satan, as we see from 2 Corinthians 4 and 4. 2 Timothy 2 and 26, it says, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are being taken captive by him at his will. You see, the snare of the devil, how does the devil attract us? He attracts men through the lust of the flesh. It attracts men through the belief that they can be whoever they want. They can do whatever, whatever they want. And this is his snare. This is his subtlety. We're against a very intelligent enemy who uses all of the things that men would desire. Adam and Eve, they desired to live forever. forever. And Satan, what did he say to him? He said, thou shalt not die. That was his lie. And he's telling people today, thou shalt not die. Everybody believes that when they die, they're going to go up either in heaven or float about here somewhere as ghosts. I mean, these are the beliefs. These are the snares that, that the devil tries to draw men in, taking them captive, taking them captive. So unbelievers are being held captive by Satan who is blinding them to the glorious light of the gospel. We know that the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ has been and will continue to be shiny because uncountable millions have turned from darkness to light, have turned from the power of Satan unto God. But sadly, the great majority of people living today still live in spiritual darkness. And what Paul is saying, it is high time to awake out of sleep. And that knowing the time that now, it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Paul wasn't saying that he wasn't saved and he wouldn't be saved until the Lord returned. What he's talking about there, his salvation, is the return of the Lord. Our salvation, our, 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 our fulfillment of all that God promised us is coming soon. And it's time to wake up. It's time for the unsaved to wake up and take away this blindness that Satan has given them. And it's time for the church to wake up and start living and continue to live as if he's coming tomorrow with a zeal to pray, with a zeal to witness to the lost, with a zeal to encourage one another in their walk with God. Anyone listening tonight, the day is at hand. The day is at hand. Remember listening to a country and western song, <clears throat> and I think the gist of it was, they wish everyone could live as if they were dying tomorrow, and this song talks about you love more dearly, and you do things that you wouldn't think you're doing. Well, I wish that everyone would live as if the Lord was coming tomorrow. And this would give us a real wake-up call in the churches throughout the world. Think of the darkness of sin. Think of the superstition and idolatry which is reaping havoc in our society today. Do you know, and I mean, it's many years ago when I was in my last job, which would be 2002, it's 20 years ago. I remember being told in Bangor within, I think it was a five mile radius, radius, there was 12 covens. That's witches' covens. In Bangor within a five mile radius. Goodness knows how many there are now. And this is happening. People, someone came to the front 
They were at our church uh, and asked us to pray for their daughter who's got caught up in one of these covens. And she thinks it's innocent. She thinks it's no harm. And she thinks she can help people and take away sicknesses and things. And you know this, uh, and I, I, I'm going to be careful in what I say here. There's a lot of worse things than that going on. There's a lot of that going on. It's the darkness of sin. It's the traps which Satan is, is setting for people. And indeed, they're falling for it because of their blindness. Think of the many in America and Europe who profess to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, yet who turn their backs on the clear teaching of his word. You've only got to read social media to see the nonsense that some Christians or church goers, whatever way you want to refer to them, that they, they want to take this verse out. They want to take that verse out. They don't want their preacher to preach about this. And they don't want to offend their friends. And it's sad when people get offended when the truth of God's word is preached. I've read Psalm 119, I don't know how many times. And it's quite a long psalm, I'm sure you all know that. And as I mean, I've said this before, maybe it's just me, but I'm sure it isn't. Sometimes you're reading and a verse comes out of the page. You know what I mean? I mean literally comes out of the page. You can see not another word in the book or in the Bible that you're reading. The verse comes out of the page. And this happened to me with Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace of they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The word of God, nothing shall offend them. You know, if we get offended with the word of God, then there's something badly wrong. We really do need to fast and pray. Because the word of God tells men they're sinners. The word of God tells men that they have to live for him, that they have to repent, they have to turn right. The Word of God tells them that there is only one way to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not many roads into heaven. There's not many roads into the kingdom of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And if someone's preaching a wrong uh, and false religion, then we've got to say, that's wrong. We're not doing it to be antagonists. We're not doing it to be violent. We're not doing it to put them down. But we have an obligation to tell people that that is not what the Bible says. If someone believes that they can earn their salvation through works, they can earn their salvation through going around rosary beads, like the, the, the Muslims, they also do that. You know, we've got to say to them, that's not the way. Jesus is the truth, the light, yeah. and the way. Yeah. And if we're being offensive doing that, then we're preaching the Word of God. And we're doing it in love. We're not doing it because we know all there is to know and we know better than you. We're preaching it because there is a genuine concern in our hearts for the lost. And unless someone's salvation is totally, utterly dependent on the death and resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God is explicitly clear. They are not saved. They are not saved. There's no way you can work your way into God's kingdom. There's no way you can buy your way into God's kingdom. And no matter how holy and righteous the leader of your church is or thinks he is, he can't get you into the kingdom of God. I can't get you into the kingdom of God. I can pray with you, but it's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that you can be saved. You know, this world which God created, despite what men say, it's a beautiful and wonderful masterpiece, isn't it? It's a masterpiece. When you look, and you know, I always think again of that psalm where David says, when I consider the, the works of thy fingers, and I just see him standing in a valley with beautiful trees and rivers, birds, some wild animals. And he just looked about, and he maybe looked up in towards the skies, and he seen the planets, or what planets he could see at that time. And he just said, what is man? He was standing in awe at the creation of God absolute awe at the beauty of the, what God has created. I don't know if you're watching television today. They were showing you the route that they were taking the Queen from Aberdeen down through into Edinburgh. And I mean, it was such a beautiful place. Uh, I've been at Dundee, but I wasn't out at that road. But, you know, I just was looking at it and the sheer beauty of the hills, the mountains, the forests. Such a beautiful creation God has made. But the sad thing is, sin has tarnished it. Sin has tarnished it. And along with sin, therefore, there's suffering and there's sorrow. And they flourish and prosper because men have been blinded and think they're okay with God. You see, it's a time of night that we live in. It's darkness that we live in and in society as a whole. But we need to be encouraged one another. The day is at hand. You know, you can look at the news 
You can see all that's going on. You can listen to some of the things that some people are trying. I told you about this politician who's trying to change the word pedophilia to minor attraction. And I, I'm, we'll just leave it there. You all know what I'm talking about there. That's going on in the world. And some people can get disillusioned and think these people are having their own way. Things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse. Economically, I personally believe it's going to get a lot worse. I believe there's going to be street unrest, civil unrest, and it's all ahead of us unless the Lord turns it round. And unless we, as we said this morning, seek the face of the Lord, fast and pray for a revival and for a mighty move of God. But in doing that, we've got to encourage one another and say, look, this means the day is at hand. There may be wars, there may be rumors of wars. You maybe look at the South China Sea and feel very afraid of what's going on there. You maybe look at Ukraine and Russia and you think, oh my word, this could escalate. America could get involved. And you could look how India, believe it or not, and China are now siding with Russia, according to reports. All these things can make you really concerned. But you know something? I believe Paul would say to us tonight, don't be discouraged because that means the day is at hand. Look up, your redemption Amen. draweth nigh. You know, that day it has been appointed by God and man ain't going to change it. And man is not going to destroy this earth because God will say enough is enough. And he will get the archangel to blow the trumpet and he will shout with a voice and the Lord Amen. will descend. The day is at hand. Let's look at that again. What did Paul mean by the day? It was evidently a well-known phrase that the church would have known back then in Rome. And I feel that's why Paul doesn't need to explain this expression to them. But in other uh, verses, we can see its meaning from his use of this particular word in other epistles. And it's good to let God's word talk for itself to help us see this. First Timothy 1 and 2. For I know in whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Against that day. In other words, we can trust the Lord as we commit things to him that he will, you know, he will keep watch over it. He will answer our needs. And we commit that unto him against that day. Philippians 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul is telling the, the Philippians that God has started a work in you. He has started this work and he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, you will receive God's blessing as you continue to serve him and God will continue to use you and bless you right until the day of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4 and 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. So Paul uses this phrase uh, uh, as in an encouragement to the church that whatever we commit to him, that he will keep it until that day, that <clears throat> he will give us a crown of righteousness. Uh, he is the righteous judge, and we will receive it at that day. But Paul's not the only one to use this expression. There are many more, just want to give you a few. Second Peter 1 and 19, Peter said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Again, we see Peter talking about being in this dark world that we live in, we see him talking about this light that shineth into this dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. That's when the Lord returns and fills <coughs> this earth with his glory. Hallelujah. Hebrews 10, 25. Amen. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day Amen. approaching. I remember reading a, a sermon which this other gentleman, a priest, and he claimed that this was how the New Testament church encouraged each other. When they were in trouble, when they're being persecuted, they used to say, the day is coming. The day is coming. And it's a wonderful thing. The day is coming. When people maybe felt like given up when they were being persecuted enough, they were being told, keep going because the day is coming. This day is the day when the bridegroom will come for his bride. 
This day that they're talking about is a day when the Redeemer will come for his purchased ones. This is the day that the shepherd will come for his sheep. This is the day when Christ will come to bring unto himself his ransomed people. And that is Christ's day. He is coming back. And this is our hope that the Lord is coming back to rule and to reign in this earth. You know, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 7 and 8, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will get that confirmation from him. And those of us that are waiting on Jesus Christ, as we've seen this morning and last week, will be endued with power from on high. That Amen. keeping power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we look for that day because indeed it will be the day of our full redemption. redemption sorry. It will be our, the day of our complete deliverance from sin and all the sin has brought into this world. Again, I said to you this morning, Paggy and I were talking about this and I quoted for Revelation 21. When the Lord comes back, there will no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, neither shall there be any more death, for the former things will pass away. That's the day that Paul told the church is coming. That's the day that the Word of God tells us tonight is coming, and we will bring honor and glory to Him. We look for that day, because it will be the day when He comes into this world to rule and to reign. A wonderful day. Again, we'll go to the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, one of my favorite sections in the Word of God. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. This mortal must put on immortality. This corruptible will put on incorruption. What a day it's going to be, church. What a glorious day it will be that we will receive a body that will not suffer any pain, that will not suffer any sickness, that will never die again. And that's because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe his word. We believe he will fulfill his word. And we believe that he will indeed come and he will call us unto himself. And he will not call us unto himself because we deserve it. He will call us because we trusted in him for our salvation. We trusted in him to be saved, to be cleansed from all sin, not just some sin, but from all sin. And so as God's people, we long for the day that the Lord returns. I'm definitely looking forward to it. And I've said many times, I would really love to be interrupted someday by the sound of the trumpet when the Lord comes back. It will be a day <coughs> of resurrection. Again, listen to the words of Jesus, let alone the apostles. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of you which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Amen. And this is the will Amen. of uh, him that sent me, that every one which seeth his Son and believeth in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen. Again, look at this. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then we'll go, to verse, uh, we'll go down to verse uh, 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I will raise him up at the last day. And I love that in verse 39, that all <clears throat> which he hath given me, I shall lose nothing. There are some who tell us you can lose your salvation. You, no one can take your salvation away. Satan can't take it away. The enemies of the Lord can't take it away. It's sealed, it's signed, Amen. it's delivered. You have the royal seal on you, Amen. and you are a child of God. Amen. You know, <clears throat> Martha, she knew about this. Martha's brother had died. We all know the story. And what did she say about her brother when Jesus came? Mar Martha said unto Jesus, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That's a confidence and a hope that not many people had she knew, although Jesus had come and he was going to raise him from the dead, and although she did not want her brother to die, 
uh, although she would love Jesus to have been there, that he didn't die. But that's a wonderful statement she makes. I know that he shall rise again in the re resurrection at the last Amen. day. Remember during a funeral, I'll not say the names, but a, a wife had died and a husband, a Christian, and we had did the committal, we had prayed, shared a very short word. And then he said, Pastor, can I speak to my family? I said, Certainly, and I stepped back out of the road. And he said, I want you all to know something. I know that she will rise again in resurrection day. And then he asked all the family, he'd love them to be with her when they came to the feet of the Lord. What an assurance. You know, you feel so sorry, and genuinely do, if someone dies outside of the Lord. What hope is there for their family? What, 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 what hope is there? I mean, it's, it, it's over. It's finished. There'll be no more. And yet, when you're standing at the grave of a Christian, you know that that grave will open again, and they will rise in Christ. All those who love the Lord's appearing shall at that day, we are told, receive a crown of righteousness. You know, we are amongst those whom Paul said, love his appearing. Love his appearing. So may the Lord continually remind us of what a glorious day it will be for the people of God. I don't know where you are now. You might be worried, maybe suffering a bit of anxiety, a bit of stress, going through situations which may be getting on top of you. Keep going because the day is at hand. The day is at hand. George Mueller said, he is coming again. And in the meantime, our business is to wait for him, to glorify him, and to be occupied in his service till he does come again. So that when at that last day shall arrive, we may be as delighted to receive Christ as he will be delighted to receive us to himself in order that where he is, we may be also. The Lord Jesus Christ, church, is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And I'm looking forward to that day when the graves will open Amen. and the dead in Christ Amen. shall rise. Amen. Living believers will be changed in a moment. We're told in the twinkling of an eye Amen. and they'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And listen to this. Death will be swallowed up in victory. The redeemed will be delivered forever from sin and sorrow. And where the Redeemer is there, they will be also forever with the Lord. But I've got to be honest, folks. There's another side of the coin in the Lord's day, and the Lord's return. Because the same day, which will bring full and eternal blessedness to believers, is all going to bring judgment and woe to the unsaved. That day when the Lord comes to be glorified in his saints, will be the day that he will take vengeance on those who know him not as God and who did not obey the gospel. We can't change that. It's in the word of God. We read of the day of wrath and revelation of righteous judgment in Romans 2 and 5. We read of the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ in Romans 2 and 16. We read of the day of judgment in 2 Peter 2 verse 9, the day of perdition in 2 Peter 3 verse 7. We read in Acts, uh, sorry, Acts 17, 31, he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. The good news is that through infinite mercy, we will be justified freely by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And therefore, we need have no fear if we trust him. But we need to trust him because he is coming soon and we should continually look for him and expect to see him. There's a Scottish preacher I haven't read much of what he wrote, but I thought this was good. Horatius and Bonner. And he lived his life expecting Christ to return. And it said at night when he went to bed, his last action before he lay down was to draw aside the curtain, look up into the heavens and say, perhaps tonight, Lord. And then in the morning when he got up, his first thing he did was open the curtain and looking out at the gray dawn, he says, well, perhaps today, Lord. What a way to live your life, to just continually think, this could be the day. And it would encourage you, it would bless you, Absolutely. and it would help you as you walk and trust in the Lord. Church, let us look forward to that day. Amen. It's not all woe and sorrow, because Jesus is coming back. Amen. Jesus is coming back, and that will be a glorious day. Amen.
It'll be a wonderful day. The unfortunate thing is the undertakers are going to be out of work. We're not going to need doctors. We're not going to need nurses. We're not going to need pastors because the Lord himself will be there to teach. But it'll be a wonderful and glorious Amen. and just words leave me of how great that day will be. Amen. We get our new bodies. Not have to diet anymore. Amen. No more gluten-free food. <laughs> what a day. What a day that will be. Amen. Amen. I better bring Peter up before I break into a song. Let's stand in God's presence. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And let's worship the Lord together.